coming out of the hole, one of the foremen on this rig is about to set the slips around a stand of pipe, while the other gets the breakout tongs ready. After breaking the stand out of the string, it is set back on the floor, and the elevators are latched on the next stand. The crew starts pulling the slips out of the rotary table as the driller pulls up on the pipe. But something's wrong. Look at the weight indicator. The black pointer shows over 180,000 pounds of pull being applied, which for the amount of pipe still in the hole on this location is way beyond what it takes to get the pipe moving up the hole. The driller pulls up and slacks off on the pipe and engages the rotary table to apply torque in an attempt to get the pipe moving. But the pipe won't move. It looks like we're stuck. What happened? It could be that junk, drilled cuttings, or perhaps formation solids have sloughed off into the hole and packed around the drill stem, causing it to stick. Or maybe, as it left, during drilling, the drill pipe wore into the side of the hole in a crooked section. The top view shows that the drill pipe forms a key seat, that is, an under gauge hole of a diameter smaller than the main borehole. And when the pipe was pulled, the top stand of drill collars was pulled into the key seat and stuck. But most likely, the pipe is stuck against the wall of the hole since 75% of all stuck pipe is caused by wall sticking. Usually, it is the drill collars that stick. It's easy to check if wall sticking has occurred. First, the crew puts the Kelly back on the pipe in the hole, and the driller starts up the mud pump to see if mud can be circulated down the drill stem. Then, a check at the shale shaker shows that circulation is good. Mud is flowing over the top of the shaker and returning to the mud pit below. But the driller cannot rotate the pipe or pull it from the hole. All of these are symptoms of wall stuck pipe. However, if no mud is flowing over the shaker, then circulation is impeded and junk, cuttings, or sloughing shale have probably stuck the drill stem. But for wall sticking to occur, two conditions are necessary. One is that there must be a permeable zone, that is, a formation that has connected passageways on which the wall cake can deposit. The other condition is that the mud or hydrostatic pressure must be greater than formation pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that the mud in the hole exerts on the walls of the hole. Looking at the problem from the top in cross-section, note as labeled at upper left, the filtrate, the liquid part of the mud, and the wall cake. Notice too as labeled at bottom center that the hydrostatic pressure in the hole is 4,000 pounds per square inch, or PSI. But as labeled at upper right, the pressure in the permeable zone is only 3,500 PSI. What's happening is that the higher hydrostatic pressure is forcing the filtrate into the permeable zone leaving a thick cake of mud solids on the wall of the hole. Because there is a difference in pressure between the hole and formation, wall sticking is sometimes called differential pressure sticking. Under conditions of differential pressure, imagine what happens if the drill stem comes to rest against the wall of the hole. Since hydrostatic pressure in the hole is 4,000 PSI and formation pressure is only 3,500 PSI, there's a pressure differential of 500 PSI. To give you an idea of how much side thrust 500 PSI pressure differential represents, suppose, as labeled at right, that a 20-foot length of 6-inch drill collar is contacting, as labeled at left, the wall of a 7 and 5 8 inch hole with a quarter-inch thick wall cake, and the collar is embedded an eighth of an inch into the cake. Now note, as labeled at right, that the contact area is 3.75 square inches of pipe per inch of pipe length. Since there's 500 PSI pressure over a 20-foot length, then, as at left, 500 PSI times 3.75 square inches per inch times 12 inches per foot 
times 20 feet equals 450,000 pounds of side thrust. If the cake were allowed to build up another eighth of an inch, then the side thrust increases to 585,000 pounds. Fortunately, however, the vertical force necessary to free the pipe is less than these side forces. Now let's stop a moment and summarize what's happened so far. First, we saw that stuck pipe can be caused by junk or cuttings packed around the drill stem, by a key seat, or most commonly, by wall sticking. Second, we saw that if the pipe cannot be rotated or pulled from the hole and circulation is good, then the pipe is probably wall stuck. Third, wall sticking is caused by hydrostatic pressure forcing filtrate into a permeable zone which leaves a thick cake of mud on the wall of the hole. When the pipe comes to rest against the cake, it often becomes stuck. Once wall sticking occurs, there are many ways to free the pipe. The first thing the driller might do is apply torque and tension to try to work the pipe loose. Meantime, the derrick man adds water to the mud. This reduces the weight of the mud, which in turn reduces the hydrostatic pressure. On this location, it's safe to reduce the mud weight because there's no indication of abnormally high downhole formation pressure that would cause the well to blow out. However, judging from the expressions of the company man and tool pusher, none of the techniques used so far seem to be helping. So the next step is to determine the depth where the collars are stuck. There are many ways to determine the stuck point, but the most accurate way is to run on electric cable an instrument called a free point indicator inside the drill stem to the stuck point. As this type of free point indicator is slowly lowered into the drill stem, the driller picks up on the stem. This tension puts stress on the drill stem. The indicator senses the stress and sends a signal to a meter at the surface. In places where the pipe is not stuck or is free, as at top and in the middle, the indicator senses an amount of stress such that the pointer on the meter moves. At the stuck point, at bottom, the indicator senses an amount of stress such that the pointer on the meter does not move. Once the stuck point is determined, a special chemical called a surfactant is added to diesel oil. The oil coupled with the surfactant has the ability to crack the wall cake and relieve much of the pressure holding the drill collars against the well bore. Enough of the mixture is made up to completely cover the stuck portion of the collars plus a few barrels more. The diesel oil surfactant mixture is pumped down the drill stem and up into the annular space between the drill collars and wall of the hole to the stuck point. After the oil surfactant mixture is placed around the stuck collars, pumping is stopped for about 30 minutes. This gives the mixture time to work. After waiting, the pump is started and about one barrel of the mixture is displaced out of the inside of the drill stem to keep the collars covered. This is done every 30 minutes or so. Meantime, the driller torques and works the drill stem. Usually, the collars come free in compression. That is, when the driller slacks off and weight is set down on the drill stem. Success. The oil surfactant mixture worked well here, so the crew continues with the trip. They know now that wall sticking is a problem, so a few items will be checked before they go back in the hole. For one thing, the crew can install a device called a stabilizer in the string of collars. Several stabilizers like this one help to keep the collars off the wall of the hole. Another way to minimize wall sticking is the use of an oil in water mud. Here the derrick man is adding a chemical called an emulsifier to the mud system. The emulsifier serves to disperse droplets of oil throughout the water phase of the mud. Oil emulsion muds reduce the friction between the wall cake and drill stem. Also, an extreme pressure lubricant can be added to the mud to reduce friction. Regardless of what kind of mud or additives is used, the mud should be weighed to ensure that the lowest mud weight possible is being used. 
This reduces the pressure differential between hydrostatic and formation pressures. Also, the amount of solids, the solids content in the mud, should be checked. Here, a mud engineer is running a distillation test to determine the solids content. It's advisable to have the lowest solids content possible for the mud weight being used. Not only is it important to control the amount of solids, but the type of solids is equally important. An item the driller keeps in mind is the mud pump. He should shut down the pump to stop circulation only when absolutely necessary. This is especially true if the quality of the mud is poor and cannot be improved. With poor quality mud, the chances of getting stuck are very high when circulation is stopped. If possible, the use of a long or oversized string of drill collars should be avoided. Here, the larger diameter pipe, the drill collars, are standing in the derrick in front and to the left of the drill pipe. With this number of drill collars, there is less chance for the drill stem to contact the wall of the hole once it is run back into the hole. Notice also the spirally grooved stand of collars, the third stand of collars from the right. Spiral collars may help to minimize wall sticking as well as square drill collars. And finally, the hole should be kept as straight as possible. Pipe contacting the walls of a crooked or deviated hole is more likely to become wall stuck. Now let's stop again to recapitulate. To free wall stuck pipe, first apply torque and tension to try to work the pipe loose. Second, if possible, reduce the mud weight. Third, determine the stuck point and spot a mixture of surfactant and oil. To minimize the possibility of wall sticking, install stabilizers. Use an oil emulsion mud, extreme pressure lubricants, low weight muds, and low solids content in the mud. Stop circulation only when necessary. Avoid long strings of large diameter drill collars and keep the hole as straight as possible. Well, here we are back to bottom making hole. Everything seems to be going fine, but is it? The driller notices the instrument that indicates the volume of mud in the mud pits, the large dial at left. He sees that it is indicating a loss of mud volume in the pits. The derrick man confirms that the driller's instrument is right. The mud level in the pits is falling. What's going on now? Well, the answer is circulation is being lost. Mud is running out of the hole and into an underground formation. Therefore, the mud level in the pits is falling. Lost circulation can occur in porous, permeable, and unconsolidated or loose formations. In cavernous or vugular formation. In natural fractures in a formation. Or in fractures that are caused or induced by high mud weights or pressure surges. To correct the problem of lost circulation, the first step is to appraise the zone of loss. We need to know the depth of the zone the type of zone, and the severity of the loss. To locate the zone of loss, one of several types of wireline surveys can be run. One popular method is the temperature survey, in which changes in temperature with depth are recorded at the surface. The temperature is on the bottom line of the chart, and depth is on the left vertical axis. A normal temperature gradient for the hole is established first. In this case, the dark blue curve. Then a quantity of mud is pumped in the hole and a second survey is made, the red curve. Notice that between 6300 and 6400 feet, the second survey curve suddenly jumps to the right, indicating a sudden increase in temperature. This increase indicates that the zone of loss is in this area. To determine how severe the loss is, a look at the mud pits as the mud returns from the hole is all that's needed. Here the return flow is reduced somewhat, so it appears that the loss is a seeping or partial loss.
the mud gradually and continuously leaks into the formation. A seeping loss indicates that the mud is being lost to small openings found in either porous formation, as shown here, or in a fractured formation. Of course, if no mud at all is returning to the surface, then the loss is complete. There are simply no returns. This indicates that the loss is in larger openings or fractures, such as honeycomb lime or cavernous formation. Since on this rig the loss is a seeping loss, the crew breaks out the kelly and enough pipe is pulled out of the hole until all of the drill stem is out of the open part of the hole and is in the section of hole lined with casing. A four to eight hour wait may allow the lost circulation zone to heal itself. But if that doesn't work, some sort of lost circulation material may have to be spotted in the hole. Generally, batches of 100 to 200 barrels are made up. Here, nut plug, that is, finely ground walnut shells, is being added to the batch. Other materials may be added as well. The drill stem is pulled up just above the lost zone, and the mixture of mud and lost circulation material is pumped down the drill stem and into the lost zone. To be successful, the seal must take place within the zone of loss, as at bottom, and not just on the face of the wellbore, as at top. If the seal occurs only on the face of the hole, it can be knocked off by the bit or eroded away by the moving mud, and the lost circulation problem would still be there. To be effective, the particles making up the lost circulation slurry must be of proper size. In a seepage loss, fine materials may be added to the complete mud system because the openings in the formation taking the mud are small. In a partial loss, larger particles of material are used because the formation openings are larger. Here the technique is to spot the material and wait, treating in stages until the hole is full. Then the well is closed in and the mud pumps started up to squeeze or force the material into the formation openings. When a complete loss occurs, the lost circulation material must be very large to seal the large openings. When complete loss of circulation occurs, sometimes it may be impossible to seal the openings and regain returns. If there is no danger of abnormal pressure, then blind drilling may be restored to. Drilling proceeds by simply pumping water into the hole to cool the bit and lift cuttings without any returns to the surface. Once more, let's stop a moment to summarize. Lost circulation can occur in porous, permeable, and unconsolidated formations, in cavernous or vugular formations, in natural fractures in a formation, or in induced fractures caused by high mud weights or pressure surges. To correct lost circulation, first try raising the bit into the cased part of the hole and waiting. Second, spot lost circulation materials of the proper size. Good drilling practices minimize the problem of lost circulation. This driller is being careful to lower the pipe back into the hole slowly after a trip out. He knows that by slowly lowering the pipe, surge pressures created by the pipe in the hole are greatly reduced. High surge pressures can cause the formation to fracture, creating lost circulation. He also avoids sputting the pipe. Moving the drill stem up and down rapidly in the hole also creates surge pressure that can fracture the formation. When starting up the mud pump, he opens the pump control slowly. Opening it rapidly puts additional pressure surges on the formation which could cause it to fracture. Another item to consider is the yield point of the mud, that is, the amount of force it takes to move the mud in the hole. It is better to use a mud with a low yield point, one that requires less force to move as it left, than a mud with a high yield point, one that requires more force to move as it right. Since a high yield point mud requires high pump pressure to keep it moving, the mud exerts higher pressure on the formations, pressure that could fracture a formation. In summary, 
To prevent lost circulation, use good drilling practices by 1. Controlling downhole pressures by having good mud properties. 2. Running drill pipe in the holes slowly. 3. Drilling rather than spudding all bridges in the hole. 4. Breaking circulation with caution. And 5. By slowing the mud pump as much as possible without jeopardizing hole cleaning. By maintaining good drilling practices and good mud properties, we can keep her on bottom and turning to the right with a minimum of problems. <laughs>